Pardon the interruption. I'm Chris Garrett, joined as always by Amy Poppinga and Sam Mulberry. And uh, guys, I can't believe we're almost at the end of June here. I mean, this is third webisode. We've got a test coming up tomorrow. Time really flies when you're having fun teaching. I don't think I don't think anybody wants to hear that summer is flying by, though, Chris. No, not at all. It's still just June. I think summer has kind of lost all meaning. So that's true. We actually decided because I'm not super busy, we're going to just go ahead and do Christmas next week. <laughs> Let's get it out of the way. We we actually sang "Joy to the World" in church yesterday because we're doing a joy series for the summer oh, service, nice. and uh, yeah, I, I, I'm okay. Like our kids used to sing Christmas carols when they're they're like two, going through Target, they'd be all jingle belling for sure. people. And I'm okay with that. That's sure. Fine. And I mean, like again, right now in COVID, like say that you know June's almost over, but if you feel like I just totally wasted June, no worries, friends, because like July, it's really just June. Only hotter, probably a little bit. <laughs> okay. Well, it's not just June. It is June 29th, which means tomorrow, June 30th, is the first exam in summer CWC. So we talked a little bit about uh, the exam last time, but we thought we should start by just kind of walking through how exams work with Moodle in online CWC. Sam, can you just remind us of what the exam is going to look like tomorrow? Yeah, so you'll see on Moodle that there is a window of time in which you can take the exam. So anytime between three and seven central time, uh, the, that's when the exam will come open. So you have to start your exam at some point within that window. And once you start it, once you click, I don't know what you click, what the actual words are you click to begin the exam, but once you click that, you'll have 75 minutes to complete the exam. And I think Amy said this in one of the first two webisodes, but I want to reiterate this. You're going to feel at some point potentially like 75 minutes isn't enough. I, we promise you it's enough, but it's not enough if you're not prepared. If you're looking everything up as you're taking that exam, it's going to feel like it's not enough time. But I promise you, we've taught this course for almost a decade now and students do perfectly well on these tests. They get through the essays, they do that. But the key is don't start that exam until you're prepared. All the tools you, you want with you, the things you need, um, anything like that, because once it starts, there's no way to pause that exam. So we talked about essays last time. And one maybe other bit of advice I would suggest is take one of those suggested kind of theme questions and just take a shot at writing like four paragraphs in response to it, just so you know how long it takes you to do that. Just so you have some sense of, is that a 10 minute kind of activity? Is that a 20 minute activity? Uh, and that might help you know how much time you have for everything else. Because I think the natural thing to do is just go in order, which means the essay will be the last thing you do on the test, which is fine. But if you've only left yourself five minutes at the end to write a 30 point essay, you're, you're probably setting yourself up to not do well on the first test. So I think it helps to get some sense because that's clearly the biggest chunk of the test. Here's one, made, one, one way to maybe try that, which is when you start the test, go to the essay, look at what it is, mm -hmm. and maybe even set a timer for 10 minutes and say, okay, I'm gonna write for 10 minutes or outline or get ideas down for 10 minutes. Then I'm gonna go take the rest of the test so that when I get to that essay, I've already got some stuff started. I've already got some ideas down there, you know, and and and, and maybe after that 10 minutes, give yourself a timer to take the rest of the test and say, okay, and then I'm going to give myself another 10 or 15 minutes to finish up that essay. So there's ways you can uh, build some things in to help you manage that test time. I think the other advice is simply don't feel like you can show up to the test and think, oh, well, I can just now search for quotations in the reading packet. I mean, you can do that, but that is a great waste of time. I mean, the best thing you can do to help with the time crunch is simply to be prepared for most of this is objective questions. Most of it is just matching. And it's really, you kind of know it or you don't know it. Now, because it's online and it's open notes, if you don't know it, you can take time to go try to find the answer, but that's time you're taking away from actually writing responses to things like the essay. Right. Amy, uh, one of the, the big questions on the exam um, that students maybe haven't done a lot with yet um, are connection questions. And I think these along with the, these even maybe more than the essay are sort of a, a high level of, a higher level of thinking than just what is information I need to know. Um, wh what advice would you have for students on how to prepare for and do well on connection questions? Yeah, so connection questions can feel sort of unnerving because you really don't necessarily know um, what you're gonna get, but this is the um, 
assessment aspects of the test where we would take two mastery terms and we would say, okay, make a connection. So what I tell students is the way to think about it is think about a conversation. Um, you know, we're, we're at Starbucks. Um, I take two terms. I take Alexander the Great. I take Homer, let's say, and I say, let's put them down and put coffee in front of them. What kind of conversation can they have? So um, like any conversation, we're going to start by who am I, right? Like, so introducing yourself, here is what this term is. Here is why it has significance. And then the other term sort of does that. And then it's like, well, what do they have in common? So what is there for them to connect over? What are their tensions potentially? Is there going to be one particular maybe idea that, ob that that's like just obvious? Like that's what's really going to bring these, this is like the first thing that these two are going to to talk about and they're going to talk about their like maybe shared um, viewpoints, but then they're also going to say, but here's where I kind of disagree with you, or here's where I think about this a little bit differently. So with connection questions, you need to be able to know, like we said, like who, who, who or what is this term? Why, why is it significant? Reminder that like we talked about this last week, significance within CWC means something different uh, than just trying to broadly think about the significance of like a exhaustively researched person like Alexander the Great, but um, put them into conversation with each other. Um, how would they be speaking about the same, speaking, uh, speaking um, differently? Um, so that requires, again, this higher sort of level of thinking. So connections are not, sometimes it's almost easier uh, to be clear, to, to offer clarity too by saying, what are they not? Well, they're not things like, both of these people are men. Um, both of these people probably enjoyed the beautiful weather of the Mediterranean climate. Like, no, um, we are looking for that higher, we're looking for the higher level connection. So it doesn't have to do with like shared geography. It doesn't have to do um, with sort of these easily identifiable characteristics. We're looking for what would take place in a conversation if we were to put these two into, into you know, literally into conversation together. Yeah, I think that's the single biggest bucket of possible connections to think about. And sometimes we even kind of give them away. Like, obviously, Plato and Aristotle is a kind of vast possible connection that we modeled by doing a uh, make the case debate last week. Um, the other way to think about it is causal connections or cause and effect connections. And so the way I would think about this is, you know, you also have to study for a timeline. And you've seen timelines. They're in your reading packet. Uh, they're in the museums often. Sometimes it's where it's just looking through the timeline as you're reviewing that and noticing what there is there ever something like one comes before another and it's because that one came first that the other was able to come second. Oh, so right. and probably fewer of those, but those that's the other kind of connection. Yeah, and, and think about these big questions. I mean, you know, we're we we are um we have a lot of content, but yet at the same time we're asking these consistent questions, you know. Who am I? Who should I be? How do I determine that? What sort of sources do I look to? So, you know, that's really a conversation that any terms could have together, right? Like, so um, think about that. And we don't pick things that are obscure. I mean, we do pick things that can be difficult, but we aren't we aren't going to pick things that are completely, you know, um, random and obscure. So I also think don't, you know, don't get freaked out. Um, just take some time. And, and it actually kind of, it, again, the key is preparation. If you're prepared, then a connection should actually kind of reveal itself pretty naturally, I think. But, um, you know, to review early Christianity, so we just kind of transitioned out of early Christianity, which um, I was pleased, at least from student responses, so many of you were really interested, um, and a lot of the content was new to you. But um, you did this worksheet on early Christianity, and we asked you to talk about, like, two early Christian debates um, over canon, over theology that were significant. Um, you know, Chris, what's an early church debate that you find especially important to this day? Because this sure hasn't stopped. <laughs> yeah, I think often students gravitate towards the question about, um, you know, what's in the Bible? How do we decide that? Is it trustworthy? Things like that. Uh, debates like Council of Nicaea, who is Jesus? The one that I've been thinking more about is, I think we just called it the Gnostic Christ Room. So we've, we've talked a little bit about Gnosticism before in the webisodes. But the question I think we put on the wall is, do you think the material world is good uh, or should Christians seek to escape to heaven? And so I think this is bound up with questions about like, how should Christians think about the body? Or, but also how should the Christians think about creation? And I really like how Mike, Mike Holmes uh, talked about, this is something Christians inherit from Judaism, this view that God is uh, a creator God who creates this good material world and has a very high view of it, but it's also fallen into sin. 
So I've been thinking about this because I'm writing this Charles Lindbergh biography. And one of the themes that Charles Lindbergh wrestles with at the end of his life is the relationship between mind, body, and spirit. And at a certain point, he actually gets to think about like, could we ever escape our body and we just kind of become awareness? And we could transcend the physical and just be mental and purely spiritual. And I found myself wanting to call him a Gnostic as I was writing that chapter the other day. Because I think there's a real danger here for Christians. Like, there, there's the sense like our, our job is to get to the heavenly realm, something like what Plato is talking about. And that's true, but that causes us to really minimize the goodness of creation, to not care about what happens to the physical environment, to not care about what we do with our bodies. And that seems deeply troubling and something I've certainly encountered in churches over the years. And then the other version of this would be something like certain kinds of monasticism we've already started to encounter. Uh, so we might have used the word ascetic to describe the early monks, people like Anthony, who engage in spiritual disciplines like fasting. And to a really radical extent, it almost feels like what they're trying to do is not just to kind of uh, train their bodies, but to punish their bodies. And they recognize that, that flesh tempts us into sin, but they almost feel like flesh is, is dangerous, is wrong, and they're trying to escape from it. And that's a really negative kind of attitude that sometimes pervades the church. And like in the 21st century, you put that together with negative body image or something or eating disorders, and that seems like a really big problem for the church not to be thinking about. So I think our view of the body, our view of the material world, our view of creation, those are really timely questions I've been thinking about. What about you two? Uh, you know, the, the the debate that I find most interesting looking at the early church stems a little bit off what you talked about. And that is in kind of the big CW, one of the big CWC questions is sort of the Christians and culture debate. So looking at like, to what degree, uh, you know, can a Christian in the early church look at, look to Greek philosophy as like a real source of, of truth and authority? To what degree can we trust those things? And that ties in a little bit to what you were saying about like, to what degree can we trust the physical world, especially if you're looking at Aristotelian philosophy. But I find that that debate so interesting because we're so, I mean, one of the themes of this course is that we're so surrounded. We swim so much in the culture around us. And like, is our faith supposed to be something which is pushing those things away or something that actually gets meaning by bouncing off of those things and interacting with those things? So I find, you know, I find people like, uh, like, Tertullian's argument really interesting. I don't know that I'm particularly moved by that argument to into agreement with him, but I find that as a good challenge to say, well, you know, are, do I just sort of accept a whole bunch of things around me, um, maybe a little too, or I shouldn't not even accept them, absorb them a little too uncritically, um, mm -hmm. where it's just, you know, where it's just like, well, that is actually just sort of what the, the ease of believing what the culture around me believes. Um, so I find, although I don't tend to agree with him, I find him very challenging. Um, so I'm, I'm actually really interested in him now more so than the people who I feel like, yeah, I agree with what that person says, who's more sort of open, you know, a Justin Martyr figure, who I think I tend to agree with more. I find myself drawn to Tertullian because I want to wrestle with where he challenges me. So Sam, as we reach the end of the first unit, a, a pretty significant figure, almost a hinge figure between the ancient world and medieval world, between the Roman world and the early church is uh, Augustine or Augustine. And uh, at least in the fall and spring, you always do a full Augustine lecture that tells his essentially his conversion story and then that starts to connect to some of his theological views that we encountered um, in the museum in the last film. So to start here, why has Augustine so long been a central figure for CWC? I think he's central to the course because, you know, in part because of the autobiography that he writes. I think we get a, a, a pretty fleshed out um, telling of the story of his conversion. So in Confessions, he gives us a view of what it looks like to be a young person. And most people taking this course are young people. What it's like to be a young person living in Roman North Africa in the fourth into the fifth century. What is the culture around him like? And then what is what does it look like to be a, a spiritual quester um, during that? And, you know, that quest ends up with Christianity. But but we he shows us actually a lot of that quest and he shows us the internal aspects of faith. So so we get into his head a lot. He's uh, he's good at reflecting back saying, here's what I was thinking at the time, but it's also memoir thinking. So he's also looking backwards and saying, um, I felt this way at the time. I didn't realize that it meant this. So like, I find him like, a in, in that way, I think he speaks to 
probably where a lot of students taking this course are at because he's writing about being roughly that same age, that stage of life. So I think developmentally even he's significant in that way. I also think he's so important to the story that we're tracking in this course um, because as you said, he is a hinge figure. He's He is a person who is firmly rooted in the ancient world. I mean, fourth, fifth century Roman empire, but his impact is so important going forward. Uh, it's almost like everything we talk about now is in some way going to be at least wrestling with Augustine. Doesn't mean it's going to, they're going to agree with him, but like the, his, he ends up having, you know, maybe an outsized impact on the church um, because of how central he is um, in that way uh, to the point where I would, I would challenge students. And I do this when I teach face to face, like pay attention to how often from here on out, regardless of what time period we're talking about in Western Christianity, that the name Augustine comes up. It just keeps coming up. Like he casts a huge shadow. Um, and, you know, I would say, uh, and maybe this, I want to throw this over to Amy, um, that shadow can also be, not always be a good thing, right? That there are, there are reasons why we celebrate Augustine in this course because of his importance and significance, but what maybe is troubling about um, focusing on someone like Augustine or the impact Augustine has. Yeah, I mean, when you cast a big shadow, there's a lot of people that are stuck in that shadow. Um, and I think that what is, is tricky is, I mean, like I agree with everything that you said, and these are the things that I, um, you know, students, I hope you're recognizing this, like we're coming to this content and we're coming to these people with multiple identities. I come to the content as a professor, as an academic, as somebody who's like being paid to do this job of teaching. I'm trying to equip you as a thinker. I'm trying to equip you as a more informed Christian. This is a shared heritage that we have as Christians. I'm also coming to this um, material as an individual Christian and also as a woman and as a as a woman historian. And, and, and none of those identities get separated. They're all, um, you, you can't kind of just be in one mode. You're in all of those. And um, right now, a, a, a debate we're having in our current cultural context in the United States and elsewhere is um, how, do we, how do we think about people who've had significant impact, influence, um, on history and what do we do with the things they've done or the things that they've said that now sitting in our current context, we very much view as being um, harmful. And when I say harmful, I guess what I'm saying is this, and um, I, we won't go into great detail here, but like um, Augustine does not take a high view of women. Um, he has a, 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 you know, a great relationship with his mother and he spends a lot of time describing his mother. But um, Augustine has this conversion experience and it's a natural part of human nature that when we move from one thing to another thing, we live our post-convert life in a constant reaffirmation of why this is better than what we were before. That's great. But where that becomes tricky, I think, as it relates to Augustine is the role that, um, I mean, he talks about like his issues with lust and then this gets tied to like thinking about sexuality and it is tied to gender. And so um, much of Augustine's writing takes what I'm going to say, this is a 21st century interpretation, a pretty dim view of women. Um, Augustine interprets, if we look at Second Corinthians, his view is that men are made in the image of God women are made in the image of men. Um, and that while women are created um, as helpers and that woman is the second creation, you know, in the garden, um, the role of helper in, in the viewpoint of Augustine, and this gets, this gets debated, but is mostly like, because women, this is how like childbirth works. Like we have, we got to have women, but it actually would have been more useful for man to have a helper who was physically helpful. And, um, you know, these, these may seem like small things, but they aren't small things when we, when we regard that Augustine, because of all the reasons you said, the influence that he has on Christianity moving forward and cast this huge shadow. And he's the one of the most prolific Christian writers. And he's going to set up really um, what Christianity is going to look like um, in the medieval period. This, this does um, really uh, limit the role of women and um, his view of women as being um, problematic because our sexuality is what causes um, all of these problems. And that becomes, that becomes um, both subtle and pervasive. Um, in the culture and the way that w the role of women, the view of women like as temptress. So, I mean, I could go on and on here, but we're going we're to see this with other figures too. So as much as we want to 
highlight and, and look at people who've had this tremendous impact, we always have to be asking that question of number one, like, you know, who didn't get to speak because they, they're the people casting the big shadow. So who's in the shadow, but, but number two, how do we wrestle with, um, not just doing, I, th I think sometimes it can be too simple to just dismiss and say, well, that, that, those were the times that was their, you know, like they didn't know any better. I'm kind of not willing to accept that. Um, but I don't have the right answer either. It just, it becomes another question that we have to engage. Yeah. I was thinking about this in the context of a big debate we're having right now. Maybe this is what you're alluding to, Amy. Um, you know, what do we put up statues to? Right. Exactly. And and, you know, so debating that with Confederates, we're even debating that with Teddy Roosevelt is having a statue taken down in New York right now. And I mean, the, the common complaint some people make is that's erasing history, right, to take down the statues. And as a history professor, I want to say, no, history is not challenged in any way by that. We're still going to talk about those people in classes. But at a certain point, we do have to wrestle with, are we raising a kind of statue within a course when we spend so much time on someone like Augustine? Now, the virtue of doing it in a class like this is we're not encountering just a statue. We're encountering at least a memory of a flesh and blood, complicated person who leaves behind sources who we can wrestle with, in a sense. And I think that's what makes it really powerful is, but it does mean we've got to be really attentive to the people we spend a lot of time on that we're not simply treating them as a kind of marble man, right? Who's above reproach, but we're thinking about what are maybe is uh, some of their insidious legacies that are left behind. And I think you're right. I think it's too easy a cop out just to say, well, they were just you know a person in the fifth century any more than we say that slaveholders were just people of the 19th century. If this class suggests that there's a tension between Christianity and culture, you can never just then use the culture as cover, right? The Christianity suggests something that maybe is beyond culture, or it maybe ought to be a thermometer or a thermostat reshaping culture, King says. And so that that I think is something we have to struggle with, but that probably is never going to be a good enough kind of excuse as we think about the legacy of these people in this class. Agreed. And I think that that's, again, to sort of bring it back to like connection questions. That's what I actually love about connection questions is they aren't statues. So, you know, I mean, and I think you're exactly right. And I actually think the imagery of statue is super useful because um, it, it, it puts something up on a pedestal. It glorifies something. It doesn't problematize it. Um, and it doesn't put it, there's no tension there. Um, and so I think that that is what I what I like about uh, kind of what we're trying to achieve sort of with connection questions. But um, to your exact point, we should always be um, challenging culture as Christians. And I think that that's probably for me, like the most relevant question, thinking about who am I right now and what we're doing is um, when we see Christians sort of on the front lines of culture, um, what will they be remembered for at the, you know, it's sort of like at this point. Um, and so that's a question we should always be asking as we also sort of are looking back in history. So it, again, it's not, um, undermining Augustine, but it is saying, okay, well, when I see what Augustine has to say about women, what were the influences that led to his interpretations of scripture? Because your life influences you and your culture influences you and your experiences do. Um, how does that look different than say what I what I see in regard as Jesus's interactions with women? It's just a worthwhile question that we need to engage. All right, well, we're gonna take a break. We'll might hear some more about Augustine though in segment two, because as we get to the end of the first unit, uh, Sam and Amy are gonna take a shot at ranking the most important people we've met so far. Back after a minute. <laughs> Well, welcome back to our pre-exam one webisode for Summer CWC. As always, we like to play a game in the second segment and maybe our favorite game, and the one we'll often do before a test is something we call food chain. So the idea here is that two of us, in this case, Amy and Sam, are gonna go back through the different people we've met, groups we've met, uh, and think through the whole first unit and then boil it all down to what they see as the five most significant figures from unit one. So this could be ancient Greeks and Romans, could be early church figures, could be political figures, intellectual figures, whoever they wanna do this, they're gonna construct a list from number five all the way up to number one. They'll take turns going back and forth. And then you're gonna to get to vote for which you think is the better list. And the process, we get to review some vocab, but also maybe we'll even start to suggest some of those connections we've talked a lot about already this webisode. So the nice thing about this is I get to sit back and just enjoy. So Sam, are you starting us off? I am. Okay. So um, at number five on my list uh, is somebody that I think is really important to put on here because I think they have a, a big 
a big impact and they tend to get missed. This is a course because it's, you know, it's a course where we talk a lot about philosophy and theology that we tend to view a lot of history through those lenses. So I always like to put Homer on this list. So number five, I'm going to have Homer um, as somebody who really helps to shape the sort of uh, mythical past of the Greeks to help lay out a lot of the Greek uh, understanding of the world, Greek values, things like that. It's also, we don't read a lot of literature in this course, but I think, um, you know, Homer through the through the poems that he writes, the Iliad and the Odyssey, um, I think really does important work for shaping the Greek mind. And these become important uh, educational texts uh, to this very day. I think last year I read two books, um, two novels written by women who were sort of working in the world of Homeric legend, trying to see that. I mean, to go back to something Amy said in the first unit, um, or first unit, the first segment, um, looking at sort of the voiceless figures in Homer and writing novels that are retelling the stories of Homer from sort of the, the perspective of some of these uh, voiceless figures. So that tells me that even uh, 2,700 years later, the stories of Homer have this kind of resonance that rings throughout Western culture. So he's number five on my list. Amy, what do you have at number five? Well, at number five on my list, I have Homer. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit. I mean, at the end of the day, students are voting for the list. So um, I am going to affirm everything that you said. I thought about making a last minute change, but like, Homer's been practicing really hard and like he's swinging really good. So I just feel like it wouldn't be right to bench him at this point. So, but what I would add about Homer is just, um, again, like I just have been thinking so much about um, really like paying attention to our culture and what do we value in our culture and what are the things that we talk about as being like, you know, patriotic types of values um, and how that like infuses into our religious values. Um, and so, and then how that then gets represented in the culture around us. And so to me, it's just like, you cannot understand Greek culture without looking at at Homer. And then everybody who's going to kind of, that we're going to sort of study after that and really where my list is heading, um, they are just playing out in their writing and their thinking and what they're building, um, the values and the sort of like the things that get articulated by Homer in the Iliad and the Odyssey. And these just central Greek ideas like virtue, um, what defines virtue, what does it, what does loyalty mean? What does courage look like? Um, again, like it has a lot to say about sort of like what's the ideal Greek male uh, in particular. And then that you know, it's sort of all over the place in the actual built Greek world, as well as in like, you know, the the philosophical, intellectual and spiritual Greek world. So I just sort of think like, um, if we if we were to read our Homer thoughtfully, and then we were to go on a travel tour to Greece, it would be like, we would see and make those connections and everything that we experience. So to me, I also had Homer at the top. So. Well, you know, I'm on board with that choice. Uh, mm -hmm. At number four, um, I really wrestled with what to do with this big chunk of sort of the, especially the early church and its relationship to the Roman Empire. We spend a lot of time on that, and that's such a key crucible for shaping the early church. So at at number four and number three, I'm going to be wrestling with this. At number four, I'm going to put Anthony of Egypt. Okay. Um, because when, Con when Constantine comes to the throne, he dramatically changes the relationship between um, Christians and the empire, Christians and government, between Christians and wealth, between Christians and power. Constantine is so important for doing that. Um, so I was thinking, well, do I just put Constantine on there? But in reality, I actually find more interesting the reactions to this than 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 the change itself. So Anthony is is one of these reactions, right? Is to really sort of push away from saying. You know, I know he's doing this before Constantine comes to the throne. He starts this. But uh, when I think about Anthony, I think about the movement that he begins. So there's thousands of people by the end of the fourth century who are following Anthony's example. So this idea of saying maybe Christianity, even if it's tempted with wealth and power and things like this, maybe Christianity shouldn't be that. And maybe we should push away from that. Um, and I also think he's significant because he starts this movement of desert monasticism, but really in, in, in ways he's ushering in this notion of um, living an intentional monastic life. And monasticism, if we think about it broadly, is going to be something that is going to exist, I mean, to this very day, but it's going to become central to the Middle Ages. It's going to look different than Anthony, but I think that response to saying, 
we shouldn't just accept the changes that happen under Constantine, but we need to respond and push back to them. So um, to represent all those, all the other desert fathers and mothers, people who are ill, feel, feel ill at ease about the changes that come with Constantine. I'm going to put Anthony number four on my list. Amy, who do you have? I like that. That's a good choice. Um, number two for me is Plato. Uh, now you and I tend to, what? Number four. Never number four. Um, you and I tend to construct our lists a little differently. I feel like we kind of think about them a little bit differently. And so for me, I'll just be, I just, I like a nice linear list. I kind of like to think about um, starting uh, at the, at sort of as far back as we go in history and moving forward. And, and I actually like that because I think it sets up well the significance of these people as our story moves forward. And so building kind of from Homer then going to Plato, I mean, there's this famous phrase where all of philosophy is really just a footnote to Plato, that Plato is sort of where it all starts in terms of what Plato and Plato building upon the ideas of his teacher, Socrates. So let's like give Socrates his proper and his due here. But the fact that um, how Plato becomes so significant that it, it's not as if we've reached this point where we are correcting Plato and saying, well, wow, Plato really got it wrong in terms of this notion of thinking about how do we understand the world around us? Um, how do we think about the the higher ideals? How do we think about the ideal forms? How do we understand things? Like, again, I, I take these ideas of courage, loyalty, um, what it means to be a virtuous person. What does it mean to have to be able to sort of think beyond just that which I can observe, especially as it relates to an idea like um, love, um, you know, piety, courage. And the thing with Plato is that everybody after him, as I said, is really responding to him. But I think the reason that I put Plato on this list, because there's lots of significant philosophers, is because of the ways in which our understanding of Christianity, if we really want to understand Augustine, if we want to understand actually Christianity, if we want to like read the New Testament and understand much of um, the imagery that's used in the New Testament, if we want to understand the culture um, that the New Testament I exists in and is responding to, we like have to understand Plato and we have to know um, the impact of, um, you know, Platonistic thinking on the society and how it gets absorbed. And so I think for me, again, my, my list is probably pretty personal today. I just have sort of thought about the ways in which my own understanding of scripture, even my way of understanding Christianity has been so influenced by this greater understanding of Plato. So I'm just going to own that like the Plato choice here at number four is really thinking about this through this lens of like CWC, trying to understand what's most significant in unit... I'm going to put him in my unit one suitcase. Here we go. Not going to leave home without him. <laughs> Solid choice. You get no complaints from me uh, with Plato there. Uh, at number three, I'm going to put Perpetua. Um, and I'm putting her there to represent the sort of time before Constantine, right? If, we're, if a lot of this unit is wrestling with that early church, the 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 dominant relationship between Christianity and culture is the relationship of persecution, or at least the threat of persecution. Um, so there's lots of early church or pre-Constantinian figures I could put there. Uh, I think Perpetua is significant in lots and lots of ways. I mean, uh, as we talked about in the first segment, this is an example of a woman who uh, creates a voice for herself. I mean, she writes an account of her, of her, um, of her trial and her persecution. So she gives us a window into what it looks like, uh, not only to be a martyr, but to be a young woman living in the Roman empire, living with the tensions of not only the state is potentially a threat to me because of my faith, but the tensions of what it looks like to live in a society, paterfamilias, uh, shaped society where she doesn't have the ability to, um, it doesn't appear that she has the, the ability to make choices for herself. One of the things she shows is that she actually is going to make choices for herself. Um, I also think about King. I think we, you know, we start this this read or this uh, course with King, and King celebrates the early church, right, and celebrates the martyrs of the early church, and how you know the that how they looked at the culture and didn't just accept it and push back on it. And, and Perpetua gives us, uh, gives us a picture of that. So I think, you know, I want to have someone to represent uh, Christian martyrdom, Christian persecution, the, the, you know, the, the red martyrs. I think that they're, they're living in the thick of the crucible of the early church. So I put Perpetua there. Amy, who do you have at number three? Well, my choice is different 
yet similar in, in the sense that I also want to highlight the importance of the early church. Um, and we wouldn't have an early church if it were not for the figure of Apostle Paul. So I put Paul um, as my choice for like really helping us understand Roman Empire, I think, um, and understanding then the development of the early church and how to, I mean, the New Testament is, you know, majority Paul writing here, but it's Paul saying, here's how we live in the midst of this empire. Here's how we respond to it. Um, here's how we draw a contrast between ourselves and the empire. Here's what it means when we were called to be when, you know, when Jesus said, I'm not here to create a new kingdom. You're my kingdom. And I guess what I mean, when I, I should say Jesus did call for a new kingdom, but he wasn't calling for the type of kingdom that many people wanted, which was to overthrow the existing governmental authorities. He said, no, 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 no. Like, you live out my kingdom and you do it by following me. You do it by um, loving your neighbor, loving me as yourself. Um, and taking care of each other. And so Paul is who has to write the manual in many respects for how we're supposed to do that. And what I think is so useful about um, Paul as a, as a writer is um, Paul wasn't, you know, just sort of writing from a lofty tower. He's visiting churches. He is like an advice columnist. People are writing and saying, but we're arguing. Um, and he is saying like, well, ah, here's how you got to figure that out. But here's what you have to do first, right? Like, here's what you got to put aside. Here's kind of some of our non-negotiables. Um, what do we do, Paul? We've got like Gentiles um, who are totally new to this thing. We've got people that were Jews that are now Christians. How do we all work this out together? And Paul's trying to say, here's the stuff that you got to figure out. Here's the stuff you need to just freaking let go of. He didn't say that. That's not a quote. Um, and so Paul is constantly in, engaging the culture, but he also kind of akin to what you were saying, Sam, about the importance of Augustine. Paul is living a life transformed. There's so much to sort of be drawn to um, in the figure of Paul, akin to Perpetua, in the sense of like these people help us think about what what does it mean to um, be be transformed, to be renewed, and to say this will probably cost me my life, um, but I I am I am working a faith out, and I think that so they they kind of have that in common. It's these examples of people who are like, what does it mean to work a faith out? It's not a faith arrived. It's not a faith perfected. Um, it it shows a lot of flaws. Now I should also kind of note that uh, some of the same things I brought up with thinking about Augustine. I think about with Paul too, um, from the perspective of being a woman. And that's not just like something I only women should think about, but um, I just sort of think like, and also just the practicalities. Paul's able to travel around this empire. Paul is able to travel around safely. Why? Pax Romana, thinking about um, the Roman empire as a place where ideas um, were circulating as were people in a relatively safe environment. So, I mean- wow. Boom, boom. <laughs> yeah, again, I that's a great choice. I'm looking at the first three people on your list, Homer, Plato, Paul the Apostle. I feel outgunned so far in terms of like, you're really bringing it. Um, so for number two on my list, I'm going to bring out one of my big guns, and that's Augustine. We've already talked a lot about Augustine. I, don't, I won't say much more um, about him, but I really do think uh, he is, he is, I mean, probably short of Paul, he's the most influential person on the Western church for better or for worse. Like he shapes so much of this. And we talked about that in unit one. So I won't, I won't um, reiterate all of that, but I think he's got to be on this list. And for me, he's got to be on this list really high. Uh, who do you have at number two, Amy? Yeah, I agree. Um, but for number two, okay. So I'm going to agree with everything that you said. Um, but for number two, I went in a slightly different direction. Again, this is kind of how the Amy, the Amy timeline breaks down. Um, you like to zag on me, right? What? You like to zag when I, I zag. I do like to zag. I don't even know what that means, you hipster. Um, but I have I have Constantine here, and I have Constantine because um, just what again, like what, and we we've talked about Constantine now throughout this entire webisode. But what Constantine represents in terms of like, what do we do when the church has power? Like to me, that's actually what's central about Constantine. So as important as it is that, you know, Constantine as a Roman emperor legalizes Christianity, it does not become the state religion. It is not like, in, you know, you don't have to be Christian. Um, it does privilege Christianity. And so now we have the, like, the, 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 the church, as you talked about it for um, Perpetua, um, the life of a Christian as relatable in the story of Perpetua 
to now a very different looking Christianity. So persecution is going to end. Christianity is going to become increasingly popular, certainly for sincere reasons, but also for kind of the less sincere reasons for the fact that it is, if your emperor is like a fan of this um, religion, even if he doesn't, he doesn't call himself a theologian. We don't, we don't even really know a whole lot about like, is Constantine like a true convert? Like, like we don't really actually know that for certain. What we know though is he admires it a whole lot. He advantages it. He sees it as something that is useful to him. That proves to be very true. Um, and so the Christian church grows exponentially. And um, we don't talk about this time period as like a period of great revival. That's not the word and the description that gets used for this point in history. It becomes advantageous to become a Christian. And um, there are going to be those who become strong vocal Christian critics of that. And we're going to see this, this, this sort of ease of living the Christian life. All of a sudden, the culture and Christianity, mm, they're actually pretty hard to pull out and to separate as opposed to what we saw with the early church where there were these strong contrasts. And so we're going to see Christian writers who now begin to critique it. But to critique it, they actually have to get outside of it because it's become so commonplace and so much a part of um, like sort of accepted easier everyday life that they have to remove themselves in order to now make that critique. So the, 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 the centrality for me of Constantine is asking this question of, hmm, you know, we've thought about what do we do when Christianity is sort of um, what we call like, like it, it doesn't have power when it seems to be sort of liminal. What do we do when Christianity does have power? That presents a whole new set of problems and um, who gets, who wins and who loses. And when we really dig into that, it's kind of not who we would necessarily think on the surface. I like that choice a lot because I actually had to use three terms on this list to get into that, which was Perpetua before Constantine, Anthony responding, Augustine kind of living in a Constantinian world. So you sum that up in one term. So I'm a better packer, Sam. I, I think so. Uh, so number one on my list, I started this list by talking about Homer and saying how we, you know, probably bend too much towards philosophy. And I wanted to have sort of culture literature as another way of understanding, viewing the world. But number one on my list, I got to go with a philosopher because I actually think this stuff matters more so than we think. I think we live in a world shaped by philosophy more than we want to think. So number one on my list is Plato. I think if we're looking at those ancient Greek philosophers and we're talking about casting shadows, um, uh, like you said, Amy, Plato is also per a personal choice for me. I think I understand Plato through Christianity, but I think I also understand Christianity through Plato, kind of like Augustine did. Like there is there is a sense in which after Plato and 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 um, Plato has this this impact on the early church, impact even on the writing of scripture. I think Platonic philosophy does to this extent that for for centuries there. The view through which, if, if we were viewing the world through a keyhole, that keyhole is Plato shaped in lots and lots of ways. It's it's a way that uh, we make sense out of the world, and I think that that shapes my own uh, my own spirituality. It shapes my own view of the world in lots and lots of ways. We talked a lot about Plato. You said I agree with everything you said, so I won't go back into that too much. But I actually think um, if we're talking, we use this phrase casting shadows. I think the the shadow that Plato casts is so big because you don't have to be a Christian. To, to be impacted by Plato's understanding of reality. Um, but I think I like the fact that his understanding of reality really leaves the door open um, and almost insists upon a kind of spirituality for thinking about that. Well, at the same time, he is definitely, definitely a philosopher. Amy, yeah. who do you have at the top of your list? Well, so at the top of my list, and students might be like, gosh, she kind of sounds like she's, I don't know, arguing with herself. Well, I am, because that's just what I do every day. But I chose... I mean, I chose Augustine as the top of my list because I want to make clear to you, students, as you're listening, like it doesn't it doesn't matter if I bring up questions or have certain types of personal issues that I'm wrestling with. Those are really important questions, but it does not necessarily deny the influence. And to everything you've already said, Sam, I mean, it's like we are we still live in the shadow of Augustine, you know. Like I still read Augustine and Augustine is again to what I said about the Apostle Paul and Perpetua. Augustine is working out in writing things I wrestle with and think about as a Christian and as somebody who is like trying to be aware of what it means to live in my particular context, culture, time. So um, and Augustine still makes sense to us to your point about his sort of personal memoir narrative piece. Um, we connect with this in a different way. And it has value because as we read it, there's nothing I like 
like more than when students read things today and they say, this feels so contemporary. Like, I feel like this was just written. So whether I, um, whether, you know, whether I can fully embrace or not, you can't, much like Miley Silas, Cyrus's Wrecking Ball, I can't deny the influence. So, um, and it's, it's going to be with us for a while. So I think that I love your list too. And in many ways, what I think um, students, I want you to get as a teaching tool again is think about the themes we've just talked about here, because a lot of the themes and the ideas are the same. Sam and I have just approached it um, sometimes the same, but also, also differently. So I don't know, Sam, I feel like maybe I did more of a carry on bag. You were kind of more of the suitcase today. Yeah, we'll see. Chris, what do you think? Uh, I think this course has been taught for like three and a half decades. I'm not sure Miley Cyrus has ever been used in connection to Augustine. So I think Amy wins because of that, but that's just me. Um, but students, you actually get to decide who wins. So you really have no other work for today. You don't have to do a, a Flipgrid video for today. All you're doing is studying for a test, but maybe take a couple minutes to go and cast your vote for who won this inaugural installment of Food Chain. We'll be uh, thinking about your choices for a while here, but we'll be right back after break to wrap up this pre-exam one episode. <laughs> All right, we're back to wrap up this webisode with happy, happy times. I'll start with happy birthday to the iPhone, first released by Apple this day in the year 2007. Man, that seems like a long time ago. Sam, what's your favorite thing about having never owned a smartphone? Uh, well, it's true is part of it. Um, okay. I think I'm going my favorite... you announce something, but... Yes, yes. No, my, my favorite thing is, is actually that um, I feel like there is... Now people love their phones, but there is this little bit of jealousy that sometimes people have. When I say I don't have one, they're kind of like, oh, I kind of wish I didn't have one. But then at the same time, they don't really want to not have it because, but and it's also, I don't have to deal, I don't have to be the type of person who admits that I'm addicted to this and then still continues to use it because I don't understand that type of thinking or they're using the word addiction in a weird way. Um, so I think it's mostly that, like, I just don't, I don't, I'm not um, as, tethered to that. I'm also harder to get a hold of, which um, might be frustrating to my friends even on this webisode with me, but I kind of enjoy that. Um, happy anniversary to the Federal Highway Act of 1956, which officially created the interstate highway system. Amy, do you have a favorite summer road trip? I do. First of all, I just want to say that of the three of us, I'm assuming I'm the only one that teaches about the Federal Highway Act of 1965. Um, shows video clips about it and then actually like shows like one of my favorite maps of the expansion of the federal highway act so i just this actually this one means a lot to me our family will be celebrating um a little bit differently than in years past where usually i just make everybody drive the 494 694 loop with me um just for kicks but yes i do have a favorite road trip and so um my favorite road trip is actually starting here uh, in I live in St. Paul and driving with my family to take two days to wind up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And this is actually not a really super difficult uh, drive to make. It's actually one I also illustrate to students, which is um, the quickest, most efficient way is to get on 35E south from my house till it turns into 35. Take 35 for 107 more hours and then take a right when you get to I-40. Um, and then you're on I-40 for a simple it's like, mm, I don't know, 42 more hours. And then you get to Albuquerque. It's the easiest thing in the world. So that's my favorite road. <laughs> and so that's what I got. All right. Anyway, <laughs> happy. And, and well, we'll save it for another webisode. Students, stay tuned for more road trip stories. Happy trails to the month of June. Oh, Chris, are you looking forward to July when average high temperatures in the Twin Cities are regularly going to reach the mid-80s? Bust out all your sleeveless tops. <laughs> so here's the thing. My favorite sport in the world is baseball. And I don't have baseball right now. So there's nothing I like about summer at this point. Baseball was what got me through these terrible, terrible months. Like, I think people, I assume most people here know what Minnesota is like. But I always have to explain to non-Minnesotans, like, I know you think it's like Siberia for nine months, and it is. But then for three months, it's terribly hot and humid and mosquitoey, and I hate. It becomes hot Louisiana, <laughs> exactly. And I'm just counting the days down until we hit like October, because September even is pretty hot. And I don't have the state fair, which my, is my other thing that I like about the summer in Minnesota. So I'm kind of dread. Like if it weren't for summer CWC and doing webisodes with you two, there's not anything I'm looking forward to about the summer in Minnesota. So pray for me. This is going to be a hard one for me to work out my faith, as Amy likes to say. 
Oh, seriously, pray for him and send him any any of the wicking plaid polo shirts that you can find in stores. <laughs> Okay, uh, students, remember, vote for Food Chain. Uh, I won't say that their sense of self-worth and dignity is bound up with it, but they're competitive and they want someone to win. And you need to decide that. Otherwise, you have no assignment for today. Just spend time studying for the exam. After you take the exam, remember that'll be between three and seven tomorrow on Tuesday. You then get a day off on Wednesday and we'll start unit two on Thursday. You will then have the 4th of July weekend. Our next webisode will drop on July 8th. So you've got a little break from us uh, for about a week or so. Any last thoughts before the exam, you two? Uh, I would just listen to the advice we gave in segment one. I think that's uh, that's what you need to be doing. Webisodes are a form of review. Watch your webisode segments. She said at the end of the webisode. <laughs> <laughs> they not arrived. Again, that's what I mean. I mean, like, watch them again. <laughs> okay, I well, we... Watch them as a form of punishment. It's great. They've seen this one four times. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, hopefully it's clear that we enjoy doing them, whatever you you all think about them, students. So we'll, we'll look forward to our next one at the start of Unit 2. Until then, I think that's all for this week. Say goodnight, Stacey. <laughs>